everyone welcome back to pop scream a day of celebrating all things horrific terrifying and strange brought to you by all of your friends from denver pop culture con and pop culture classroom horrific um, terrifying and strange that's why we're here right tation i was gonna say that's me <laughs> that's that's been the whole theme and why they're letting this be on the show that's why we're still here which one yeah. of us is which because there's there are three of us so we'll just one... maybe by the end of the show we'll know for sure which <laughs> okay is fair enough if you've missed it or you weren't with us earlier in the day, we've been running streaming all day. We've talked to the Scout Horror Comics creators. We were able to get the method of writing horror with Stephen Graham Jones. And in the last session, uh, Matt and I got to do makeup and transform ourselves into a unicorn and a zombie. So if you haven't been able to see those, make sure to go back and watch. They're available on YouTube. But now we are here with our guest and uh, really Denver pop culture. <laughs> is that the, is that the nomenclature at this point? It's, it's exactly. It is now. Oh, it wow. Is. I'm getting that on the back of a jacket. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing, Ken? We haven't seen you since Reno pop culture con. Is that right? I know that's yeah, that's correct. Almost a year ago. I'm doing all right. I can't complain too much. I'm safe and comfortable and it's snowing here in Boston, which is odd. Uh, but you know, the world's broken and that's where we're at. So <laughs> we sent our know, snow your way then. It's true. We had some snow a couple of days ago, but now it's it's all turned into mud. But that's Wait, Colorado also, and it's probably late, right? Yeah. <laughs> also, I want to make sure uh my co-host, Matt Slater. Hi Matt. What up? Did you get all the unicorn makeup off? Uh, I, most of it, but if you are staring at your screen wondering, is that gentleman wearing eyeliner? Uh, the answer is a little bit still, because uh, I did not prepare and get the stuff to take the eyeliner off. So it looks very natural, though. I think you could get Thank away you. with it. I Thank you. I appreciate that. Like a like a rock star. Like it makes you look very deep. You're thinking about deep thoughts. I'm just channeling my emo guy liner days. So there, there you go. Mm hmm. I still have liquid latex in my hair, so that's why I'm I'm kind of rocking the, the side look because it's covering up the zombie that is still left in my hair. <laughs> but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about ten, excuse me, Ken and your podcast. So let's just really start with tell us about the podcast. Yeah, I have a podcast called TV Guidance Counselor. So I've done it almost seven years now. And essentially somewhat, I own every issue of TV guide, like a sane person does. And for years, people would be like, why do you have all these TV guides? And my answer was always for alibis. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like where was I on the night of June 5th? I was watching this. I'll tell you all about it. But um, <laughs> then I came up with a good reason to have them. And uh, basically someone picks an old issue of TV guide from my collection. They go through, they write down what they'd watch that week in history. And then we talk about their choices and it's, pretty simple concept it's very fun there's a lot of people i've had on that i have no business speaking to uh so so that's always interesting i think that's the best part about having a podcast is like really you is. are way cooler than i am let me talk to you for oh a yeah like i have a ted dancing on a jane seymour on a jello biafra from the dead kennedys two weeks ago it's very strange that's amazing and i think people love talking about what they watch there's something so like nostalgic and comforting and exciting about you know remembering these great shows that you watched in the past and yeah. tv's so different nowadays too like it it, it's totally yeah. different you don't go to the guide you go to netflix and just say shuffle what, what are you going to play for me netflix yeah and that's the big difference i think and i always talk about it like those of us who grew up pre-millennium it's the shared experience that we all had there were fewer choices and they were on at a day and date so mm -hmm. you watch them all together and now we've sort of I don't want to use the word artificially because that sounds negative, but we've artificially recreated those sorts of things with people doing watch alongs and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But that was what we did. And so there were people who are roughly my age or younger or older, where if I have nothing in common with them at a minimum, I can be like, we can discuss the show we all watched. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that connection piece, real quick, if you guys are watching this live, you can be connecting with us as well and be yeah. asking questions for Ken, asking questions of us, reacting to some of the things that we're going to talk about uh, from this issue of TV Guide, which we haven't revealed which one yet. So, I think we have revealed. I, I think it's on oh, the screen. I, I was asleep. So we <laughs> did not. <laughs> it's been a long day. 
<laughs> so Ken, you chose this this particular TV guide. What drew you to the TV guide of October 27th, 1990? So this is actually my favorite issue of TV guide, which is ridiculous. People are like, because people will ask me, which is a weird question. And it's even weirder that I have an answer. But uh, <laughs> I always say everyone's sort of television sweet spot is between the ages of eight and 12. That's <laughs> usually when you're like old enough to have your own taste, but not old enough to like leave the house or do anything. So you're kind of watching the most stuff. And this is right in my sweet spot this is october 27th november 2nd uh november 2nd 1990 i was 10 years old and this is a specific issue about horror on tv and that is just tailor-made for me well and it's a specific issue that really kind of goes meta about horror on tv and talks about the you know what's changing and why it's changing i caught myself reading through the articles, and I have to say, from the times that I have used the TV guide legitimately, I don't think I had ever read any of the articles. You just kind of flip to what you want. This, I really enjoyed it. It was. The articles are amazing. Like they, like Isaac Asimov wrote for TV Guide. Harlan Ellison wrote for TV Guide. Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, Michael Crichton. It, it's amazing the people that wrote for TV Guide, and there's some pretty fascinating sort of media study type articles, uh, and and sort of predictive articles. Like uh, whenever I pick up one from a, an election year, it's sort of disheartening and also fascinating to see their predictions for where we're going, where like sort of politics mm -hmm. and entertainment collide, and they're. <laughs> Pretty much exactly right but like 30 years early <laughs> so that's interesting then because they talk about the prediction of where horror is going in the first article in this guide do you think that they were right uh they were and they weren't i think what they didn't anticipate was uh and i was talking to you guys a, a little bit about this before we started recording because you're significantly younger than me you're about 10 years younger than me so so yeah for the audience we were we were both <clears throat> I, I am a child of 1990 so definitely yeah. did not watch any of this I, in the day i'm a child of the 80s but just barely. Yeah, and your your parents were were good enough to show you cool stuff. So right. you're you're slightly uh, ahead of most people. But Debatable. most of these <laughs> most of these shows were huge bombs. And I think people looking back now, where horror is so popular in a mainstream way, um, would be shocked that these mm -hmm. shows were huge bombs. And if they had been made ten years later, I think they would have hit an audience and a generation that grew up with. Buffy the Vampire Slayer mm -hmm. and things like Supernatural and that sort of stuff. And so in that respect, I think it's changed. Um, it also has gone back to this sort of era, because I think in the early to mid 2000s, we had a lot of the sort of saws and, and mm -hmm. hostile and the sort of uh, hyper violent. Yeah, the horror movies that I like to call, ooh, I bet that hurts movies. <laughs> where that's kind of the thrill. It's like, ooh, that probably hurts. But we move more towards back towards sort of monsters and supernatural stuff. Mm. Um, my sort of media studies theory is that millennials like rules um, in a lot of ways because monsters, especially supernatural ones, are all about rules. Like magic is all about mm -hmm. rules. It's like if this monster has these powers, he can be defeated by these things. Mm -hmm. If they, if, and it's it's very very cut and dry and and i think the sort of in a lot of ways and this sounds very pretentious so just stop me if i'm pretentiousing which is not a word uh but i'm not very well, well educated make it one now yes um <laughs> but we'll put it on your shirt yes pretentious thing <laughs> on the front and then the rocks denver cover rocks on the back um but it is nothing is scarier than than chaos and anarchy like just mm -hmm. no rules just you can't reason with anything. That is the most terrifying thing. And so weirdly, I think putting monsters and supernatural stuff out there in the in the media is very comforting because mm -hmm. it's controllable and fightable because <laughs> there are rules. And so I think as the world got more chaotic, and especially in the late 90s, or early 2000s, for a variety of reasons, mm -hmm. uh, that that generation that grew up that way found a real comfort in this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think at 1990, we did as well, but it was not quite there. <laughs> mm -hmm. So one of the things we actually, so this is a product of Pop Stream, which is our, our weekly streaming show. And yesterday we had the AV Club uh, doing an episode on horror adaptations. And we brought up the It 
adaptation from 1990, the TV miniseries, which mm -hmm. is in this TV guide as yep. like its premiere, right? Yep. And one of the things that our guest, who's a horror expert, brought on was that that kind of changed what horror could be on television. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you think about that? Because I, of course, I saw it much later in life and I was like, this is trash. This is terrible. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't get the nostalgia for it. I love Tim Curry, but even in this, I'm like, oh. And it's definitely colored by the fact that it is one of my favorite books of all time. But I don't, do, you, do you agree that that kind of and the things also coming out around this time is sort of what propelled that? Yes and no. I, I would say that in general, Stephen King is what changed horror on TV because mm -hmm. Salem's Lot was 1978, 79 uh, was a two part miniseries. And that is perfect that is terrifying and a perfect adaptation of that book and actually improves on the book because if you've read salem's lot the the character played by james mason doesn't exist in the book mr barlow mm. is more like that character and so what they did with the miniseries was they made barlow a monster like nosferatu and sort of the the regal um sort of christopher lee type dracula became the sort of renfield that is the james mason character which mm. was necessary for storytelling on the tv show but improved on it and that was sort of the key where stephen king kind of works best on television in a lot of ways and huh. it was it in the stand which was in 94 i think um really adapted those perfectly and i had issues with the the newer it that i didn't have with the tv it and <laughs> Uh, you know, they're both flawed in certain ways, but I will say Tim Curry is a much better Pennywise uh, mm -hmm. because he's, he's terrifying, not creepy. I have Penny a moment that I recall vividly as a child where I snuck out, I was told to go to bed. I snuck out because obviously I wanted to know what everyone was watching and from behind the couch watched it. <laughs> and the visceral, the like deep way that Tim Curry's Pennywise sticks with you is it's not matched i think i was expecting <laughs> the newer version of it to be scary so maybe there was the unexpected of what really in <laughs> broke my brain with the <laughs> early version but yeah. Kat, there's nothing like tim curry in that one because he he sort of represents this chaos in that yeah he, he's, he's you don't know what the rules are when he's around like he can make anything happen yeah and he also seems like he can beat the hell out of you like he's mm -hmm. he's a big scary presence and sometimes that's more unsettling than the sort of creepy childlike factor of the new one um but and and i'm sure the sort of special effects and that sort of stuff were off-putting um but it, it really managed to tell that story pretty close to the book. Um, and you also had some other Stephen King adaptations for TV at that time. Like sometimes they come back, which was actually pretty good um, in various other stuff. And the thing that I like about those is that the restrictions of TV at that time made them have to get a little more creative and up their game a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you need to get uh, uh, better actors. You need to get a little bit creative and, and be more unsettling because you can't just get away with Gru, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so some of these things are more interesting. Also, it grew out of, in 1985, so about five years before this issue, we had a huge resurgence in anthology shows. And mm -hmm. that's sort of a direct correlation to the 1950s. So the 50s and the 80s, politically and socially, were very similar in a lot of ways, which is someone smarter than me has probably gone into <laughs> but if you look at the media from that time it also reflects that so there there's a genre of shows i call the magical being we have to pretend we don't have in our house i'm sure there's a snappier name than that but in the 50s no, i like that it's yeah. very descriptive <laughs> yeah you had like mr ed bewitched i dream a genie my mother the car mm -hmm. my favorite martian and they were all about sort of people having secrets in their home <laughs> that mm. they didn't want mm -hmm. their they didn't want their neighbors to know about and mm. facetiously i argue like you know swap out the genie with a gay son or something like that that they're just like there's this family unit that they're you know they they love this thing that's different and have to pretend it doesn't exist for the outside world hmm. we got a huge resurgence of those again in the 80s so you had alf you had out of this world you had Mork and uh, Mindy, uh, Mork and Mindy uh, the, the Harry and the Hendersons show. There was a horrifically 
terrifying show called What a Dummy with a talking ventriloquist dummy. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, there was I just imagined about- like uh, the Goosebumps dummy and I'm sure that, that's yeah. not pretty really accurate. Yeah, Stephen Dorff <laughs> was in it and it was pretty terrifying, um, but it was a sitcom comedy. But we, st- we saw all those again. And as a result, we also started seeing uh, the anthology shows come back to the fact to the point where we had the new Twilight Zone, the new Alfred Hitchcock presents. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and we started getting Stephen King adaptions in those as well for the first time. So George Romero, who uh, horror, legendary horror director, mm-hmm. um, he and his uh, producing partner, Richard Rubenstein, created a show called Tales from the Dark Side. And that was really the first horror anthology show of the 80s and they're very low budget a lot of them are bottle episodes with one actor uh there's one with jerry stiller he's the only person in the episode he's a dj that starts turning into a a demon um but (laughs) they also adapted stephen king stories like uh word processor of the gods and uh tom noonan who plays frankenstein in monster squad actually wrote directed and starred in an episode of the show monsters that is an adaptation of stephen king's the moving finger that is amazing so you started getting those as well and the first adaption of a clive barker story was on tales from the dark side they did the yattering and jack from the books of blood so we were starting to get this more modern aesthetic from writers who you would think wouldn't be able to translate to television. And so that sort of led us up to this 1990 where you have a building um, pressure of these sorts of shows doing well. I don't know if I answered the question. (laughs) I just learned so much in like those two minutes. I know. (laughs) But it was cool. Like Deep with it. As a kid who read all that stuff, it was amazing to be able to, you know, especially where movies cost money. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have a lot of money as a kid, but I can watch Tales from the Dark Side for free. Mm-hmm. I can watch mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. for free. Yep. And it's in my room. And something about horror on television is also scarier in that it's much more intimate in that you're usually alone or in a very small group. It's piped into your house. It's not in a theater where you can leave and leave it behind. It's in mm-hmm. your environment, which is something about that is scarier. And so I think that also is what um, led to this sort of resurgence. There's also a practical factor in that it was relatively cheap. And we had this huge boom of cable channels where they had this sort of arms race for content and would air anything. So they were just like, make anything, which we kind of see a parallel now with the streaming services mm-hmm. uh, who are also doing horror anthology series. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. So, yes. yeah. Um, so that was a factor as well. I keep not thinking about, I love your comment where you say, you know, that the TV is there. And I just watched the original Poltergeist yesterday and I love the final scene. Spoiler alert. If you haven't seen it, go watch Poltergeist. (laughs) When they take the TV out of the, they kick it out of the hotel room. And I think I, looking back to, you know, the times that I would watch scary things, the, the TV being something that you almost wanted to like turn away, like I'm done. I need to separate myself from this space. I have to now close the laptop, whatever I'm watching it on to separate from this experience. Yeah, it's sort of an open conduit into your house. It's like an open window. Well, earlier we talked about taking mundane objects and kind of uh, putting a a creepy twist on that. We talked about that with Stephen Graham Jones and, you know, how certain horror, like uh, one of the books that Tajan was reading, she said she'll never be able to look at pantyhose the same way again, right? Mm -hmm. And horror on TV, it it sounds like it can do the same thing with your television. Like you remember that visceral experience that you had on your television. Yeah, and I think there's a thing too about, uh, specifically about anthology series as well, where you don't know what you're going to get every week. You mm-hmm. sort of know it. You know it's going to be a horror story, but you don't know the characters. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know the rules, and so you can do that on a horror TV show that's different every single week, where you can't do that in a in a movie. Honestly, that's why I stopped watching Black Mirror. Like I loved it. It was so good, but it was so stressful. Yeah, because I didn't know what was coming and I didn't know those rules. So it's an interesting point. It makes me think that for me, I'm a terrible person, and I I hate admitting this on a live stream i i tend to read the end of movies if they're very stressful because i i need to know i need to know what what is coming at me am i going to enjoy this because i don't enjoy 
that stress. It becomes, I can, I can love a scary movie if I know everyone dies, but if I'm waiting the entire time <laughs> for everyone to die, it bothers me. But I, I had an ex that, that did that and I got so mad at him. <laughs> well, that's the sign of a good movie though. If, if you can watch it when you know what's going to happen and it's great, mm -hmm. that's a good movie. It's not, it's not reliant upon just the twists that mm -hmm. are coming the the plot twists so if the ending's given given away like people sometimes people who like hate spoilers i'm like well really a spoiler is only ruining something that's not very good and the only thing that's worth watching it for is the spoiler right. if it, it's almost better you know it's that that hitchcock thing of the the ticking time bomb where when you know it's under the table and it's going to go off it's somewhat better because you know if it just explodes you're going to be shocked you didn't know it was there and you know like what happened you'll get a reaction but knowing it's there you have this tension and you're waiting for it to happen um like even like something like once upon a time in america uh in hollywood i'm sorry um <laughs> when the first time I, I don't like quentin tarantino it's a whole other thing but oh no uh, yeah oh he's, no he's the puff that's, daddy of movies he that's just, shook he's having a rough day with you. I, I really ate candy corn and we don't yeah. like tarantino what yeah. is going on he just samples from better movies he has good taste <laughs> but here's the thing uh once upon a time in hollywood I, I'll, I'll ruin some of the ending here people should have seen it by now it's been a year the dog uh, food well yeah well just so knowing about the manson family when you're watching that movie you're waiting for the bad thing to happen and it's hard to completely enjoy the movie especially where it's a it's a funny movie it's mostly a comedy um because you're on edge waiting for the bad thing to happen and then when it doesn't you're like now i have to see it again because <laughs> i need to be like relaxed knowing it's not going to happen and i can enjoy all the other pieces of this movie well, and that's kind of like a Tarantino thing, too, is Tarantino, in, in my opinion, is so good at doing lots of dialogue and then having a, a payoff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think of Inglorious Bastards specifically, that you have long moments of dialogue building up to a moment, and you get a few of those relief release points throughout the film. Once Upon a Time in, in Hollywood, uh, you don't get it until the very end. And so if you're a Tarantino fan, you're like, Som something's coming, something's coming, and it doesn't yeah. go until the very end of the movie. And it's one of the least Tarantino Tarantino movies, which is probably why I liked it a lot. <laughs> um, you know, and, and there's other things too, like it, it it did a thing that only Hollywood can do, which is to give real life a Hollywood ending and, you know, take the thing that pretty much ruined old Hollywood or killed old Hollywood and sort of rewrite mm -hmm. it. And there's other things there. But mm -hmm. yeah, that sense of dread uh, can, can sort of ruin something. You'll get a bigger reaction, but it's at the expense of the whole journey. And And I think... For me, almost all stories are journey, not destination. Like if it's mm. if you're if you're reading a story or watching something just for the destination, like yeah, just watch the end. Who cares? Mm. You know what I mean? That's a good point. Enjoying that process. I have that right now. I'm watching streaming the Bly Manor, the mystery of Bly Manor on Netflix. Haunting, yeah. Haunting. And I know the story that it's based on and some of the you know earlier versions. So I have had a I know where it's going. I've enjoyed it immensely. Whereas the people that I'm watching it with that don't get that, that don't have that, you know, sense of where we're going to be at the end are struggling a little bit with just not enjoying the journey. And I like that kind of way to describe it. Or even a show like uh, Castle Rock, which is mm -hmm. the most Stephen King show that is not one word written by Stephen King or based on <laughs> a word written by Stephen King, but it takes place in the Stephen King universe. And if you're familiar with Stephen King, there are little Easter eggs in there that you enjoy, but you know his reoccurring themes. Like, it, you know, mm -hmm. can a place be evil? Um, is your destiny and your genetics uh, to be evil? Is that is that something you can't break away from? You know, uh, fathers and sons, letting people go. You know, like all the things that Stephen King writes about in his books are in that show. And not knowing the plot because there wasn't a book for you to read, mm -hmm. <laughs> but knowing the themes, you you can sort of relax a little more and follow along because mm -hmm. the, the unfolding plot isn't necessarily the whole thing. Right. It's those, uh, the nuanced pieces that you can appreciate a little bit more. Very nice. Okay. I want to, before we jump into our um, videos that we have, I want to see, Ken, what were you watching this week? Do you remember? 
I do. So I was watching one of the things I distinctly remember was there was a syndicated thing called the Horror Hall of Fame. And they only did it for three years. It was a two hour long award show for horror. It was basically like a Fangoria magazine TV show, more or less. And it was amazing. They previewed new movies. Uh, Steve Johnson, the special effects guy, had little segments where he taught you how to do makeup effects. Like he taught you how to make uh, monster teeth with Starburst which are very effective. Um, he taught you how to do a uh, buttonhole bullet holes, which is just mortician's wax. You pull it with a fishing line, like super easy stuff that he does in movies that you could do at home mixed with, you know, Robert England hosting it and uh, little retrospectives on like classic horror, like Boris Karloff's daughter was there, got an award. Like it was just a really well-rounded um, sort of overview of, of the stuff I liked at that time. So I 100% watched that. Um, that sounds that, amazing. It was fantastic. And, the, and then the other thing I distinctly remember watching that week are actually two things. One is my favorite Halloween episode of all time. And it's from the show Highway to Heaven, which is a show that I generally don't like. Um, <laughs> sort of every decade has a God show. Right. So you have, you know, Touched by an Angel, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. God Friended Me, like like there's every decade has one. And in the 80s, it was Highway to Heaven. It's our Michael Landon and he was an angel and it's sort of monster of the week, like a problem of the week. I have to help these people, uh, you know, fix whatever. But this episode is called I Was a Middle Aged Werewolf. And for people that don't know, um, Michael Landon starred in the, the 1950s movie, I Was a Teenage Werewolf. And so it's a play on that. And Landon wrote and directed this episode. There's a kid, it's on Halloween night. It feels like Halloween. Kids are out trick-or-treating. There's a kid who's in an abusive home. And basically Michael Landon takes him out uh, trick-or-treating, but turns into the werewolf from I Was a Teenage Werewolf to like scare <laughs> away bullies and stuff. And it's just so good. Uh, and... There was a, a TV show version of Parenthood, not the current one. There was another one in 1990 based on the movie with Thora Birch in it and Ken Ober. There's an article in here with Ken Ober, who's from Boston uh, and hosted Remote Control. Uh, but they did a Halloween episode that night with them trick-or-treating. And, it, and it, those two episodes, I distinctly remember watching, and they feel the most like Halloween's felt to me as a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I love them. It makes me want to watch all of them. Now I'm going to try and find, particularly that the Fantasmic one you talked about uh, first. Oh, oh, the Horror Hall of Fame? That oh, one? yeah. I, yeah. I thought there, you had something else for it. Yeah, I, I need to find that. I yeah, need to watch that, it now. That is up on YouTube. Uh, they, people have put those up on YouTube, so you can find those. And all of Highway to Heaven streaming. Uh, Parenthood's difficult to find, but the other ones you can see. <laughs> So one of the things that we did, Matt and I, in preparing for this is we kind of went through and looked at things that either we remembered or that we were just kind of interested in seeing. And I we actually that. went and found trailers for them. I so, Ken, you have not seen these. Let's let's look at some of these trailers and uh, we can blind react together and talk about these movies. I'm excited. I absolutely yeah. love this movie. I can't wait to see the trailer for it. Second. I gotta pull up my other window. <laughs> Here. Ah, I'm familiar with this one. This is spectacular. So this was the cycle of eco horror that we had in the 70s, been a where it was animals was attacking, strange. but they were attacking because we were we were control. performing horrible things to the environment. <laughs> I love the way that they really play on the B sound in this movie. The buzzing. Yeah, there was a lot of bug movies in the 70s. There was one called the, uh, there was one just called Bug that William Castle produced that were about these cockroaches that burst into flames, uh, <laughs> which was pretty exciting. Uh, the Bees was obviously excellent. Um, you also had Kingdom of the Spiders, which had William Shatner in it. Uh, and just people generally being terrified of animals. A lot of them were made for TV. This one was not. This was a full on. And you have John Saxton, who's like exploitation film royalty. He played Nancy's dad in Nightmare on Elm Street. Most people know him from. Or mm -hmm. um, he's also in uh, Enter the Dragon. Uh, and John Carradine, where if there's a if there's a bad horror movie, enjoyably bad horror movie made between 1950 and 1990, John Carradine's in it. <laughs> Now, we just saw a bunch of bees take down an airplane. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Well, they, this is, this is almost like a precursor to Sharknado. Um, 
but it's a yeah. story of bees. Yeah, and and there weren't a movie like Bees was not done tongue in cheek either. Like it was, a, they were doing playing it completely straight. Uh, there's a movie from 1985 called Slugs uh, that's directed by oh a Spanish guy. It takes place in New that is also plays it straight and is just ridiculous. Uh, there's an oh, excellent. No. It's ridiculously amazing. Because yes, slugs kill people and yeah. they slowly. Very, very slowly. Yeah. So did did this kind of evolve out of like the birds or sort of? Yeah. I mean, the birds was a huge hit. Obviously, it's a it's a Hitchcock movie, but was much much earlier than this. This sure. was sort of a mixture of um, Jaws and the birds. Okay. So okay, it was okay. nature run amok. Uh, there's even a movie that I watch every Easter. I think it's from 1974 called Night of the Lepus. And if anyone speaks Latin, they know what Lepus is bunny rabbits and it's about giant killer bunny rabbits that come and attack the world but it's not a comedy on purpose uh it is totally amazing and i love that you watch that on easter <laughs> every easter you gotta watch night of the Lepus. um but yeah i mean people were generally afraid of eco horror it was like a true concern in the 70s of of killer bees and these sort of stuff you know murder hornets murder again, hornets yeah. Yeah. and and in and nature is scary because it's chaotic or we can't control it. And a lot of people, especially in the seventies, uh, much like today know that we're, we're damaging it. Like we are its enemy in a lot of ways. And so it's like, it's going to fight back. You know? <laughs> and that was a, that was a pretty, uh, pretty pervasive fear. I think this is really interesting for Matt and I, because the, the concept or the theme of chaos out of control, I think it's come up in each panel that we've had Every today, one. Yep. starting with, you know, we did a session early this morning with, you know, the Hulk and the, un, the lack of control that Bruce Banner has and how terrifying that is. And then, yeah, we're seeing it that the unknown and the not being able to control your destiny or your body or the world around you is, is a constant fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially insects, which I think everybody knows outnumber us about a million to one from various insects, and they're around all the time. <laughs> and you're like, oh, if they just work together, we would be in trouble. Well, and you have those biblical connotations. If you look at Christianity, it... Yep. Locusts. Locusts. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and, and you also had other things, too, like uh, around this time you had... Um, there was a movie called Dogs that was about packs of killer dogs. There was a movie called Dracula's Dog that was about <laughs> Dracula's dog. Uh, there was actually a really fascinating movie called White Dog that isn't isn't a supernatural horror movie, but Sam Fuller did it, who was uh, an amazing director. And it's essentially about a racist dog. It's about a dog that was trained to attack non-white people. Wow. And it and it's a movie about racism and like, uh, but in this exploitation movie. And, mm -hmm. and you could get away with that as well because allegory is the greatest uh, mm -hmm. sugar pill where, which has been true forever. I mean, horror has always been allegory and sometimes it's not even intentional, but you can teach people good life lessons <laughs> through horror because it's, it's just a Trojan horse of being a better person. Like the thing I always say about Twilight Zone is, you know, you couldn't watch more than five episodes of the Twilight Zone and not be a better person. Mm -hmm. Huh. And be I... a little sad. Twilight Zone makes you really, there's those deep thinking things where you come away from it and you're like, oh, Oh, we're terrible. Yeah. We're terrible. <laughs> yeah. I would have done that. Yeah. Based on just this trailer, I definitely would have watched the bees. Uh, yeah. It looked very amusing. <laughs> I have to give a plug for the frogs too. If you're looking for those like old school eco terror, I love the frog. Yeah. Or squirm. Have you ever seen squirm? I haven't seen squirm. Oh, worms. Earthworms. Oh, now I have to look for that. They're so I, good. It made me think of slither, but I think that's a little different. Yeah. A little different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay this one i was really excited because you can actually watch all of a she-wolf from london on youtube it's on my watching list now that we get to see the trailer it was supposed to be a semester of study abroad but for co-ed randy wallace i can't hear an attack by a werewolf maybe i believe that the person. audience can hear it but we okay. can't okay. Okay. We just get to no, enjoy the imagery. Because this show, this which is featured here prominently, this is one of the shows that I think of right away when I'm like, if this was 10 years later. So nobody was doing television aimed at girls at all, um, mm. or especially like teen or tween girls, which wasn't t particularly a thing. And this show 
although it is a general audience show, it's about an American um, uh, exchange student who essentially gets bitten by a werewolf in England and, and is struggling with being a werewolf, which sounds like a show that would be on CW or Nickelodeon now. Mm -hmm. And it was a syndicated show. It was actually pretty well done. Um, and it lasted for three syndicated seasons. Um, I think it changed its name to Love and Hisses or Love and Curses or something later. Um, but it's a pretty that cool a, show. That wasn't a great decision. No, <laughs> not no, to say. No. Uh, but they were trying to make it sound less exploitative. Mm -hmm. uh, she Wolf of London, like you know exactly what this is, mm -hmm. <laughs> and 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 that's a great thing. But they didn't seem to think that way. Um, and they thought that the title was off-putting to you know uh, the audience who was watching like nine hundred two one zero or something. Mm -hmm. um, but again, like this is a really cool show that could be rebooted today or even watched in its in its form from then, and is very very entertaining. Um, there's another. Oh, sorry go ahead i was just gonna ask was it was it episodic like did she do like one thing in each episode or i immediately go to fighting crime and i'm sure that's not what she would do but that's like the genre <laughs> yeah. I grew up with. it sort of was so this was sort of bridging the gap between when we had serialized stuff and the sort of monster of the week episode stuff and there is a lot of serialization in this there was a show in 1987 called werewolf that was actually what launched the fox network and it was the show fox put all of their money into there was two shows that and one called mr president which was a disaster but it was a huge <laughs> hey, at least problem. one of them was successful right that's true and actually the show that they was the the biggest afterthought the two biggest afterthoughts at fox in 87 were america's most wanted and married with children which turned out to be their two biggest hits <laughs> And they were just throwaway shows. But Werewolf was essentially a similar plot in that this college kids get kid gets bit by a werewolf, becomes a werewolf, and then the horse of the show is him trying to track down the bloodline of the werewolf so he can free himself of the curse. And it wasn't the most well done show, but that concept is very interesting. And this show, She Wolf of London, kind of takes that and improves on it. Is it is it related to the American what is it American Werewolf in London? Yeah, the John Landis movie from eighty four. Yeah. It's not. It's not. Um, but it is playing on the uh, visibility of that. Um, mm -hmm. And and you know oh and an American Werewolf in Paris, the terrible sequel that everyone forgets <laughs> happened. <laughs> I was just thinking how many different time, like thinking Teen Wolf, um, like so many different, cause you, you've mentioned like three different shows where teenagers are turned into werewolves. Yeah. Um, but that's, <laughs> at but least. That's, I mean, werewolves are an allegory for puberty, like, especially at that time, male puberty of that, like unleashed beast. Oh God, um, we're growing hair. <laughs> yeah, I'm growing hair. I'm out of control. Like I have these instincts, like animalistic instincts, and so it really is sort of perfect for that. What things like She Wolf of London did, and then the movie in 2000, Ginger Snaps later, um, yeah. which sort of, uh, I think the first thing I remember seeing it in was there's an Alan Moore story in his Swamp Thing run um where it ties a girl's period to being a werewolf in this whole yeah. cy cycle of the moon and that which. I would never have thought of what makes really perfect, perfect sense, sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and that sort of having to suppress anger and rage and um, that females go through. And we start seeing that moving more into a mainstream sort of thing and it becoming less of a, where a werewolf is less about just like unleashed male, you know, animalistic raw, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Um, and I really like seeing you don't, Maybe you see it more now, but at this time, I don't know if you were seeing so often of women being in that role. And this was a woman as the protagonist and as the monster, mm -hmm. which even today, you don't get a lot where women aren't, you know, if they are featured in the story, they're, you know, propelling it along generally for a male protagonist. Mm. And they don't get, you know, to embody what the story is about. So I thought that was really interesting in this, that she gets to carry it all yeah it's a it's a it's a very rare sadly a very rare thing and a super unusual thing for 1990 to have the protagonist be uh, a young woman in general but especially mm -hmm. in a horror show yeah absolutely yeah because women in horror you usually think of it as the scream queens mm -hmm. or the one who's going to die in some terrible and usually scantily clad manner. Yep. It's either they're a succubus or they're in peril. It's one or the other. <laughs> like and there's like no in between there. And and it's much more complicated than that. I was trying to look for a family friendly classic horror movie that didn't have boobs. 
if you if you tried to like look for Halloween or Nightmare on Elm Street or Friday the 13th, they don't exist unless you're very comfortable with some with some nudity. There's some great ones though, like Night of the Creeps is boob free. Uh no, okay. I'm sorry, it's not. No, I'm sorry, See? it's not. Um you think it is, and yeah. then you're like, no, oh Night well, there's boobs. Um, have you ever seen Lady in White? <laughs> It sounds familiar. Mm -mm. Lady in White is a ghost story. It's super family friendly. It stars Lucas Haas. It takes place in the 60s. It's from 1990, actually. Um, and it's just great. It's like if The Wonder Years was a ghost story. Oh, okay. It's really and great. Lacking nudity, which is... <laughs> there is. I, I am 1000% certain that does lack nudity. <laughs> there there's there's going to be a message at some point where I'm like, Ken... There were boobs. Yeah. <laughs> if there, if there are boob, yeah, if there are boobs in Lady in White, I will, I will ship you um, the dessert of your choice from any restaurant in the world. Oh, okay. well, I've got okay. some Photoshop okay. work that I need to get I to. Got, yeah. yeah, that's exactly it. Okay, well, we've got our next one, and we've already talked about this, but I love this trailer, and I think it for me is going to bring up a lot of memories. So don't judge me if I'm like watching between fingers. But we have the trailer from it. And this was such a huge event. Well, and so much from it as you watch it that is now just Already iconic. Perfect. Yeah. Just the bright red on the outsides. <laughs> what about it did you dislike? I'm curious. Defend your poor I, ideas. We watched it a couple of years ago before the remakes came out. Um, and I think it was just so cheesy and I watched it immediately after reading the book and I just think it was I had such fond memories and feelings from the book that this just didn't quite it I don't know it didn't quite stick to the book is so realistic mm -hmm. um yeah. as, as realistic as it can be you know with these otherworldly presences coming to earth and things like that and this there was something about that that didn't have that realisticness to it it's, I mean, it's a it's a tough book to adapt. Yeah, and and there's there's things that they, I mean, I could talk about this these movies in this book specifically for like hours. But um, I love the way the new one looked. The kid actors were amazing in the first one. It was weirdly, incredibly influenced by Stranger Things, which so is much. odd because yeah. Stranger <laughs> Things is like Stephen King fan fiction. Um, <laughs> but they they root they missed two things that really really bothered me and this actually ties into what you're saying about the female uh in trouble and sort of the we have to rescue her mm -hmm. and the tv movie didn't do this and one i'm glad both did not show the scene of right. course that we all know yeah. which mm -hmm. is a completely unnecessary scene. so yeah even stephen king even, even when i say like it's yeah. one of my favorite books ever i'm like but that didn't need to be there no it doesn't <laughs> and stephen king is like well at the time i thought this but i'm like ah and i'm like you were on a lot of cocaine uh which he admits um, <laughs> we'll be things on cocaine yes um but uh the the tv movie did this and the, the new movie didn't and what it did was in the new one beverly is captured by it and they have to rescue her, mm -hmm. which is not in the book nope. and it's not in this. And there's a reason for that because the whole point is they're only strong as a group mm -hmm. and they each need to be part of the group. That's what gives them their strength. So it completely misses part of the point of that. Um, and it, the new one way overly sexualizes Beverly. Mm -hmm. way overly and i get that that's part of it too because again it's that age where kids are you know their female friends all of a sudden they're like oh this is weird um which is part of it but it's too much in the new one and, well, it and in the book it. in the book it was almost like they all found this thing that they liked in beverly right and that they were all attracted to and it wasn't necessarily her appearance whereas in the movie it was, it was a little more like we need to show the audience why all these uh boys are attracted to her she's kind of the final piece that makes them realize they are a group they're the captain mm -hmm. planet you know they <laughs> they all have the rings and she's heart you know um and and when you take that away it just it it it's wrong <laughs> Well, mm -hmm. and when you make that, you know, Beverly, the way she matures and, you know, she's going through coming into being a woman, when you entirely sexualize that from a male perspective and make that about what she can do instead of what it means to her and what she's going through without that male component, it's, it misses something there as well. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. it misses the point, which I, which the the TV movie does not. Um, and I don't know why that change was made. The other change that really bothered me was where they made Mike not the historian anymore, mm-hmm. and he becomes mm-hmm. just like they root like his character is so shallow in the new one. He's just like, it's real. Why yeah. why have you done that? He's just kind of there now, like he's not the historian. Like the whole point is they all bring a skill set like the justice league to be able to fight this thing. Um, and that uh, uh, the people we find through shared interests are the sort of the family we find are the things that keep us from uh, who, who prop us up from our fears, you know? Um, and, and it, it sort of ruins that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I but- do think that this film is such a, it is a perfect, just, object of the time and especially for appearing on television and that is something that you have to appreciate when you watch it even if i'm looking at it going like why why did you do this why did you make these choices but i get why it was so important to do at at the time yeah and tv movies were a whole different thing which we were talking about earlier too where there's so much you couldn't do Mm -hmm. and limitations and and a lot of tv movies were directed by exploitation directors like wes craven made about six made for tv horror movies Mm -hmm. uh Mm -hmm bunch of these people that did them because they knew how to work cheap and work fast uh Mm -hmm. david cronenberg directed a couple episodes of friday the 13th the series um Mm -hmm. one of them is amazing it's called faith healer and it's like this great lost david cronenberg movie almost but as an hour-long episode of this anthology Mm -hmm. series so um you know there, there are aspects of that as well but you're also robbing those guys of the sort of cheats they have which are boobs and uh mm-hmm. you know <laughs> so over you know, really gory violence so they have right to, right you know. yeah. i think too for me this has so much iconic imagery that it, i think drew a lot of people to stephen king that maybe hadn't or wouldn't have read him before mm-hmm. and just is so now embedded into popular culture that even if you haven't seen it any of the versions or read the book you know the significance of the balloon Mm -hmm. and at night you may give a little bit more leeway around that rain gutter as you walk by (laughs) because you have those associations georgie's Mm -hmm. little outfit like Mm -hmm. the you know um it also is weird to update it to the 80s because although again there's correlations between the 50s and the 80s so in some ways they're interchangeable but there's definitely a lot of race stuff a lot of the juvenile delinquency stuff a lot mm-hmm. of the stuff that sort of inherit to it being in the 50s mm-hmm. uh in the first part that i that i prefer fur in this version as well well yeah i mean the whole book opens with a hate crime against a gay couple right and when they updated that to be in present day i mean that still happens but it didn't read the same it didn't come across with the same Mm -hmm. kind of feeling that it did in the book yeah because a lot of this the the book and a lot of stephen king's stuff is about sort of generational sin that taints a place mm-hmm. an entire mm, yeah. place yep, yep, yep. so you know if it's pet cemetery where the ground is soured or you know the shining or these other movies and and historically there was more of those society um either looking the other way or participating in these horrific transgressions against humanity mm-hmm. in the 50s and 60s mm-hmm. i mean you know uh, and and that's why we started to get in a lot of ways this golden age of horror in the 80s was people who grew up in that environment mm. and you know went through things like vietnam which was the first uh war we actually had on television that was right. not propagandized by mm. the government putting out videos there i mean literally Every night on television in the in the sixties and seventies, they were showing Vietnam, and the footage you see now of like the monk setting himself on fire and horrific dead bodies that was on the news while people were eating dinner with mm-hmm. their parents, uncut, unedited, and people grew up with that. And you started to get this, um, you know, it reflects in horror more mm-hmm. than any other genre reflects what's going on in society, either intentionally or not. And mm-hmm. that that's one of the things I love about it is looking back to different decades. Um, you know, you can see what sort of what was going on. And those responses that people have in that the horror genre as a either movie or TV, wherever you're at, gives you the ability to control some of that chaos that's going on around you. So if you're afraid of it, at least this gives you the parameters, the rules that you can adapt and survive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it gives you it gives you a formula for defeating it mm-hmm. um, in a lot of ways, and so there's Which that cathartic. Sorry, Ken. Go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. Yeah, it's a comfort. Um, 
it is and i think that's why some people struggle with movies like the nightmare on elm street where you don't get that happy ending you don't get the the way to defeat the monster and you're just kind of left with even more chaos at the end which is very unsatisfying like it's mm-hmm. just it's scary but it's incredibly unsatisfying yeah Okay, it looks like we're ready for our next clip. Liz, our producer, has it all pulled up. This one I'm also very excited for and is now on my watching list because who knew that there was an entire show about Dracula as like a businessman? He's an evil businessman, (laughs) yeah. This show is... Blood-sucking, sounds about right. It's wonderfully terrible. So, yeah. So, again, this was aimed at kids. This was... Essentially, Dracula is an evil businessman. It is the 80s, you know, late 80s. And these kids, they figured it out. They're the ones who knew that he was an evil businessman. The main kid you may recognize because he went on to be in um, Are You Afraid of the Dark? Uh, He was one of the Midnight Society kids um, because this was shot in Canada as a lot of horror anthology stuff was in the the 80s and 90s, including, um, of course, Friday 13th, the series. But yeah, this is... Only these kids know Dracula is an evil businessman. Their grandfather's in on it and these kids have to take him down because no one believes him. Because it's, it's, you know, I forget what his first name is, but his name is Al Ucard. (laughs) Get it? (laughs) Um, And he's like this evil international businessman. But again, that shows us like what the evils of the 80s was, was this greedy uh money hungry conglomerates that were sort of ruining the world and 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 ruining people's lives <laughs> even we should have listened yeah. we should have listened back then <laughs> yeah but if I you even, yeah if you even look at like in the comics like the way lex luther was redone as a businessman mm-hmm. instead of a mad scientist you know um in the same thing here it's 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 that was what was going on in the air and this is a fun dumb dumb show (laughs) i mean that intro that we just watched was the most what i would consider the most 90s-esque like Mm -hmm. tv intro that we've seen so far um i also love the font that they wrote dracula in that's incredible it sets the tone right from the start and the kid's got a sun gun it's like a laser (laughs) gun that shoots sun rays that's what that was the whole point of the series is that they need to defeat dracula yeah they they want to either expose him and defeat him and like he can't just kill these kids because like he's a prominent businessman he can't just kill (laughs) some kids uh and like you know he's got all these money and resources and no one believes them and it's it's very interesting um Hmm. it it reminds me a lot of the same year we also had a war of the worlds tv series in syndication that eventually got really stupid as well uh due to budget constraints they essentially the aliens had to possess people because they couldn't show aliens at one point but it was also yeah, it became a sort of very similar thing where it's this quest to expose this conspiracy. And that's the other thing, too, like um, conspiracy theories fall into this in that people make these things up because it's easier to believe there's a plan, because if there's a plan, we can defeat it. If there's people behind a thing, we can expose them. And instead of just, no, nah, man, no one knows what they're doing. It's right. complete chaos. It's just random chance and anything could go wrong at any time. John Oliver has a whole special about it. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so it's it's comforting for people to think of conspiracy theories. Mm-hmm. And that seeped into these things in the 80s, like War of the Worlds, like They Live, like Dracula the series, where it wasn't just that uh you know it's one monster it's now a whole conspiracy of this underground thing and no one believes you and it's Mm -hmm. that invasion of the body snatchers kind of thing which is why we saw remakes of like invaders from mars in 85 toby hooper did a great remake of that there was two different remakes of invasion of the body snatchers between 1978 and 1998 uh and a remake and a i think the first making of robert heinlein's puppet masters which is a similar story um you know the i I was actually thinking like animorphs uh with the whole conspiracy theory thing like yeah yeah it's it it makes and for kids especially the whole world feels like a conspiracy theory Mm -hmm. because you feel like adults are all in on this stuff that you can't understand or they're withholding information from you or or that kind of thing so it's kind of perfect to to aim that at children which is why you saw it with dracula series as a kid show Hmm. i'm always intrigued with shows like this that put that they have such a strong end goal like there is the end goal to it and i always think that they struggle once they kind of reach that end goal with what to do next which kind of sounds like where you get with the the war of the worlds that 
that had a very definite end to it and where do you go from there right yeah. it's and, and that's the that's the difficult nature of storytelling on television and why anthology series work best with horror because mm. most horror has a definitive goal mm -hmm. whereas you can do that in a 30 minute single story but when you're writing a tv show especially at this time when you didn't know how long your series would go on now mm -hmm. you you know you have a deal with netflix you're like it's 13 episodes i know where the story will end mm -hmm. if i have to do a sequel series i'll come up with something but i, right. I can do a storyline uh, at this point, they're like, you might have 24 episodes, you might have 10, I don't know. So you <laughs> kind of have to string the story along without ever resolving it, but still try to keep people engaged, which is a really difficult way to approach mm -hmm. storytelling. Um, and and it that's why some of these things suffer. Um, you know, 1990, we also had Twin Peaks, which in, in many ways is a horror series. Mm -hmm. um, and really isn't about the mystery of who killed Laura Palmer. It's about her being, having been killed, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the majority of people they're in was the mystery. And midway through season two, when they solved it, everyone didn't care anymore. <laughs> so yeah. it, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, mm -hmm. um, which is again, why people now will watch homicide or CSI and they go all day. Cause it's, it's a very familiar comfortable mm -hmm. formula and at the end of the episode you know everything ties up nicely mm -hmm. and i'm enjoying that some tv is going to that no we're only going to do this 10 these 10 episodes like hbo's watchman mm -hmm. uh he was like nope th this is the story that's it we're not doing any more um yeah. so it's like the, a little bit of a course correction there yeah and i mean and sometimes it works in the opposite direction like one of the reasons i sort of checked out of the new doctor who was because you can only set the highest stakes ever so many times. Mm -hmm. It's like the whole universe was uncreated and recreated again. Like <laughs> you've already set the highest possible stakes. Yeah. Now kind of nothing else matters. Supernatural, I think, fell into the same kind of thing as well. You know, I think there is a, a shelf life on these stories where these end of the world conspiracy stories mm -hmm. where once you hit the, the ultimate, there's nowhere to go. Yeah, I mean, Walking Dead suffered from that really bad. And whereas the comics, even the comics got repetitive for a little bit and then finally kind of worked their way out of that, the TV show, I feel like, did not. Um, and that's why so many people dropped off around, like, season, season seven. Yeah. One of the reasons. And I think the other thing, too, that I didn't highlight w was the rise of video games in the 90s and 2000s, which was, I think, a direct influence on the fact that zombie movies have become so popular in a different way than they were in 1990. So in 1990, we got a remake of Night of the Living Dead that George Romero actually made himself. Tom Savini directed it. But it it was sort of the last traditional zombie movie where um, the zombies as zombies didn't matter. They were sort of just any threat. It could have been giant bunny rabbits. But the whole <laughs> point of those were people refused to work together. They ignored the problem and uh, they're selfish. And that's what ended up, you know, doing us all in. Mm -hmm. And instead, it, it later becomes, well, these are zombies are overwhelming and it's kind of fun to just keep shooting them. <laughs> you know, um, And it becomes more of that, that hurts horror. Like, the, mm -hmm. oh, that would be scary if I was trapped there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, unfortunately, I'm I'm sad to say that we have to wrap up our discussion. I think I could keep going and keep talking. <laughs> I wanted to go off on how this applies to X Files too, and the way that X Files changed. But now, we don't have time. It's so also we'll connected. To, it's so it's yeah. all intertwined with chaos and uncertainty, and how we try and control the world around us. Yeah. One thing Ken, that we've done with all of our guests today is that we have five long questions that we've asked them so we can kind of end there. And this is just, I've got five questions. Give us what you prefer from each of them. Uh, and then we can make fun of Matt some more when he has the wrong preference for each of these. Okay. The first one, do you prefer the kind of spooky or very scary? Ooh, um, spooky. Spooky? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you prefer your media more zombies or ghosts and hauntings? Mm, I'll go zombies. Zombies? Mm, good okay. choice. What is your favorite horror movie, game, book, comic, any of those? Which one is like the number one thing that you're going to go to? Um, oh, like number one medium? Like a movie, no, a book? Or, like or your or favorite property from any of those mediums? From any of those. Um, I'd have to say the original Romero zombie trilogy. Okay. Very nice. Okay, next one. Favorite 
And I'm just going to go on a little tangent here and talk about Ken has amazing jackets. And if you get to see him like at con, some fantastic jackets. But I have my Haddonfield Halloween jacket on. (laughs) It's amazing. I loved your Ferris Bueller one. I mean, there's just some fantastic jackets. But what is your favorite Halloween costume that you've ever worn? Uh, the best Halloween costume I ever had was I did Space Ghost once, and I would one hundred one hundred percent have worn that every day. Wow, that's, <laughs> that's a good one. Next Denver Pop Culture Con twenty twenty one, Ken Reed, Space Ghost. Space Ghost. I I wanted. Did you to, host a show as Space Ghost? I would, yes. and actually, last Denver Pop Culture Con, I wanted to do Captain Marvel Junior Elvis mashup because Elvis <gasps> Presley based all his. Uh, suits on Captain Marvel Jr., the Shazam Captain Marvel Jr. Literally, he was a huge fan of the comic and had them just make Captain Marvel costumes, which is why he has that little cape and everything. So I wanted to be Elvis Captain Marvel Jr., but I couldn't make a costume. Wow. I'm I'm already, so assistant director of programming, in my mind, I'm seeing all of these things for 2021 <laughs> that he prepared for like a long list of what about this costume? Yeah, right. <laughs> like, we use like rigging. We'll have you fly in. Yeah, no, I okay. match your disposal. Okay. Oh, you're in Brack? Oh, nice, Brack. That is an nice. excellent Brack. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last question. Favorite Halloween treat? Candy, any? Reese's, Beverage, Reese's whatever. Reese's peanut butter cup. Go Reese's, Reese's peanut, butter, peanut cup. butter cup. The original, the classic. Classic, original size. Nice. I'm going to add one question. How do you feel about candy corn? This has been a the point of contention. It's old people candy. It's it's waxy. No. It tastes, but uh, I don't hate them. But they're not my favorite thing. They're, I look at them like candy canes. They're a necessity for the holiday, mm, but they're mm, not my mm. first choice to eat. Fair enough. Okay. I will. We'll take that. We'll take okay. that. Okay, we'll take it. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have. I love that I get to say that. This has again been Pop Scream. If you missed any of this episode or this panel or any of the panels we've had earlier in the day, they're all available on our YouTube channel, YouTube slash Pop Stream, which is our weekly running channel. As Matt said in the last one, we've only mixed up Pop Scream and Pop Stream about 50 times today, but follow the pop stream, like ring the bell, and we will be uh, bringing this type of content, not only again later today, but every week. So mm-hmm. Ken, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's nice to see amazing. you. And, I learned uh, so much in this panel, <laughs> so much. And I'm come sorry. back in 30 minutes when the pop stream AV club is going to start streaming their horror game and we get to hear Matt Scream. Scream. This will actually be screaming. Nice. (laughs) All right. Thanks all.